As someone who has never owned a Nintendo 64, I think it's safe to say that the majority of the console's library has aged poorly. Even former powerhouses like Super Mario 64, Smash Brothers, and Ocarina of Time. There's very little these games can offer that later games in the series can't do better. However, one game that I can say has aged very well is Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards. You can consider Kirby 64 a sequel to Kirby's Dream Land 3, making it the fourth in the Dream Land saga. And you'll find a lot of the same tropes here. Dark Matter makes his return, this time terrorizing the peaceful planet of Ripple Star. The fairies of Ripple Star give their magical crystal to Ribbon, who takes it to Pop Star for safekeeping, but Dark Matter manages to break it into pieces, which scatter across the galaxy. Now it's up to Kirby and his friends to track them down. Yeah, it's retreading old ground, but if Bowser can kidnap Princess Peach for the umpteenth time, why mess with what works? Besides, you don't play a game like this for the story, you play it for the gameplay, and that is Kirby 64's greatest strength. Unlike games like Castlevania 64 or Mega Man 64 that forced themselves into 3D when they really didn't need to be, Kirby 64 took an approach that would become a staple for the series from this point on, namely a 2.5D perspective. I think the graphics have aged so well because this is Kirby, it's not like they're trying to go for something hyper-realistic, it's not even dealing with humans. The graphics are bright and colorful and the simplistic look works to the game's benefit rather than its detriment. Although I would argue it's almost too simplistic, almost none of the enemies have any kind of texture or shading so they just look kind of unfinished. I also don't think it's a coincidence that they chose enemies that would be the easiest to model in 3D, so you're not going to see anything as impressive as Heavy Lobster or Knuckle Joe. Even Meta Knight doesn't make an appearance here. Instead, you have really simple baddies like Cairn that's just a pile of rocks, or Hack, the walking stone axe. I guess it's just a sign of the experimentation of early 3D models. Even when navigating through the 3D levels, Kirby is still locked to a 2D plane, but that plane can follow a path that might curve or go into the background, allowing for a really nice cinematic quality as you move through the stages. It's still a side-scroller, so it feels like a Kirby game should, but it pushes it into the third dimension in a way that the game can handle. One thing that did make the transition to 3D is the bonus round, which is pretty much identical to the bonus round of Dream Land 3, but with an added element of selecting your angle as well as your jump power. The boss battles got a 3D upgrade as well, with some rather creative use of the arenas for its time. In terms of gameplay, there are three crystal shards in each of the levels with an extra one from each of the bosses. As you start out, these shards are more out in the open and obvious, but later ones require you to jump through hoops to reach them, like destroying the scenery with a certain power, navigating a tough platforming segment, or just exploring an out-of-the-way alcove. It's the melding of the platforming and puzzle-solving gameplay that really gives you a reason to go for 100%. Yeah, sounding kind of familiar, right? In terms of overall design, this is almost identical to Dream Land 3, just without the animal friends to help you out. Instead, you have the rather intriguing concept of mixing your powers together. At any time, you can drop your star to use it as an impromptu projectile, or throw it at another power-wielding enemy to fuse the two together. With 7 powers, that means 35 possible attacks, which is a notable downgrade from Dreamland 3, but a lot of these are really impressive. So you know what that means, it's time for the best and worst powers of the game! <laughs> now, maybe someone at HAL realized that most of the powers in Dreamland 3 were really situational and unimpressive, and made an effort to remedy that here, because a lot of the abilities in this one are freaking awesome. You've got the Lightning Rock, which bounces around the screen and pretty much kills everything, the Flame Sword, and the Refrigerator that makes it so you never run out of health. This game even has a double-bladed lightsaber in it, and it came out less than a year after Phantom Menace. Coincidence? Oh, well, maybe. But as for my personal favorite weapon, it's Cutter and Bomb, which makes these awesome exploding ninja stars. They go so fast they're invisible until they hit an enemy, but they're so much fun to use. As for the worst, it's kind of complicated. The dynamite is really powerful, but it can hurt you as well, unless you make sure to duck when you use it. But anyone who's played this game, you know what the worst power is. It's fire and ice. You turn into a melting ice cube. Maybe this is meant to be some sort of a joke, but the range is just pathetic and it doesn't make for an effective weapon. Another notable ability is Cutter and Stone, which carves Kirby into a statue of a random animal friend which actually has the abilities of that friend. Who and Pitch can fly, and Rick can climb walls, which is necessary to obtain one of the Crystal Shards in a later level. And that's the only appearance the animal friends make in this game for some reason. Instead, Kirby spends most of the time palling around with Waddle Dee, Adeline, and King Dedede. In fact, there's a rather interesting character moment where you battle King Dedede as an early end-of-stage boss to rescue him from being possessed by Dark Matter after which he sticks around to help Kirby, and you even get to play as him a few times throughout the game. Crystal Shards integrates a few mini-games into the levels, like riding a sled, minecart, or raft with Waddle Dee, solving puzzles with Adeline, or the aforementioned King Dedede sections where you're breaking down walls with your hammer, and then unceremoniously chucking Kirby through the doorway at the end. <laughs> I love watching that. 
There's a couple of other weird changes that were made in this game. First of all, Kirby can no longer fly infinitely, which I never understood the reasoning behind. Kirby was always supposed to be just a fun, easy platformer, so this seems like an attempt to add a needless limitation just to make the game a bit tougher. I don't mind this change too much, since there aren't many points in the game where you can just fly through the room anyway, but one change I do actively dislike is how Cutter works in this version. Kirby literally throws part of his face as a boomerang, leaving him vulnerable and unable to fly until it comes back, but it's so slow it feels like it takes forever, so you're just waiting for the boomerang to return to you just so you can continue. This causes Cutter to go from one of the best powers in the game to one of the worst. First. I also don't really like the change they made to Stone. Now Kirby turns into an invincible stone golem of himself that can walk around and the little particles that fly off of him when he transforms can damage enemies. Personally, I think this is just way too powerful. There was a trade-off in the older games. You were invincible and you dealt tons of damage, but you couldn't move so you had to be clever when you chose to use it. Now maybe if Golem Kirby was just for double stone it would make more sense, but instead that's just a bigger version of this power. After collecting all 74 crystal shards, you get to go head to head against the final boss, Zero Two. You know, as much as I like the character designs in these games, they don't always have the most creative names. Here you get to take him on by riding around on ribbon and shooting him with crystal bits in a shooter segment. This part is fun, but it feels a bit more like Star Fox than Kirby. Personally, I think the first version of the final boss is a lot more creative. It's a 20-sided polygon that shifts through seven different forms based on the powers in the game, and you can only damage him with the power of whatever form he's in, so you have to constantly switch your powers or spit his projectiles back at him. Zero Two is just some generic shooter boss like we've seen several times before, just this time in 3D. There's also a few controversies associated with this game that I'd be remiss if I didn't point them out. First of all, there's Edo and Adeline. You've probably noticed a difference in audio quality a few times in this video. Well, that's because the first time recording this, I called her Edo because, well, she looks exactly like him. But no, this is a completely different character that just happens to look exactly the same and then has the exact same powers. Are they brother and sister? Did Edo do some soul searching like Birdo and now prefers to be called Adeline? Is this some sort of Lutes twins thing? It's never explained and neither of them appear again. Hal has a really weird obsession with creating a character that draws enemies to attack Kirby. I just wish they'd pick one and stick with it. But the really big controversy here is Shiver Star, which spawned a lot of fan theories about its true identity. It looks just like Earth, covered in a thick layer of ice and frost and filled with factories and robots. This has led to theories that Kirby 64 takes place hundreds of years in the future where Earth has been consumed by an ice age and is now inhabited by intelligent robots. Now, who do we know that likes to conquer planets and cover it with robots? Well, I guess it's a question for another time. Finally, let's talk multiplayer. You'd think with this being an N64 title, you'd be able to play four characters at once and wreak havoc through the game with your friends, but no, this time it's relegated to three small mini-games unrelated to the main story. There's 100 yard hop, which is really just a competition to get to the end first. Press B to hop forward one space, press A to hop two spaces, and avoid puddles of water for the fastest time. Bumper crop bump, where you move around and try to shove each other out of the way to catch the most falling fruit and Checkerboard Chase, probably the best game of the three, where you whack board pieces to try to cause your opponents to fall and be the last man standing. These are fun enough, I guess, but I think maybe they should have either added a few more or put the effort into adding multiplayer to the main game instead. Kirby 64 was probably the best way for the Kirby series to make the jump into 3D. I could almost picture the failed prototype that must have existed for this game, with awkward 3D controls, a camera that won't cooperate, powers that need to be aimed in a wonky first-person mode, but instead we got something familiar, but new. Classic, yet innovative. The developers knew what risks to take and what to leave intact in order to put gameplay ahead of forced technological innovation. But now, it was time to shove that all out of the way and go, let's do something crazy again. 